good to be with you folks. I've always enjoyed the fellowship of this church and the opportunity we've had to come over and be blessed by the special speakers that your pastor has graciously uh, allowed to come to this pulpit, Brother Hiles and Brother Gray, and so many good, uh, godly preachers that uh, we in the Northwest don't normally get a chance to hear. Amen? And I appreciate the hospitality that uh, your pastor has always shown to us. And he's been a good friend to me. He's encouraged me. We had pews in our first auditorium that uh, were given to us by your church. And they served us well for a good number of years. And we passed them on to another church. And they're still in use. And so you might, uh, some of you might remember those old brown wooden pews that were in this church. And I'm glad to tell you they're still in the Lord's work. Amen? <laughs> so, but I would appreciate your prayers for my family, my wife, and uh, she's recovering here this evening from the surgery this morning and uh, we just put it in God's hands and trust him to do what uh, his perfect will is in all of our lives and uh, some of us uh, we know perhaps what's wrong with us and other people don't and so the only difference is that uh, some of us are trusting God more for the unknown than others amen I'd like to preach to you tonight from John 21 so while you're finding your place there we just maybe tell you a little bit about our work in Oak Harbor. We've been there for 13 years, just had our anniversary here the 16th of uh, this month, and uh, have been ministering mainly to the military, of course, in Oak Harbor. It's a Navy base. And so we've had uh, the privilege of seeing many people come and uh, many people go for 13 years. And so we know folks all over the United States, I guess, almost every state in the Union now, there's somebody that we could go and uh, know very well as a, as a brother and sister in the Lord. And uh, if we, I would say if we were passing through that state, we would be more than welcome. And the Lord Jesus said, if you're willing to give up your friends and your acquaintances and your lands and your houses to serve him, that he'll give you a hundredfold in this life. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven. He'll give you a hundredfold more in this life. And uh, anything that I've ever had to forsake for Christ, he's given it back to me multiplied times over in, uh, in the 13 years that we've been there. And so we rejoice in that. It's good to be with you tonight. So would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word tonight from John 21. John chapter 21. We'll be reading verses 1 through verse 5. And you follow along while I read tonight. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, the two, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing. And they say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, No. You leave your Bibles open that place. We'll pray. Father, we rejoice in being able to be here tonight in your house. It's good on the Wednesday night uh, midweek time to assemble ourselves and be refreshed, to be encouraged, to share burdens in prayer. And Lord, to be challenged from your word, I pray that tonight we would say something that might challenge this church tonight to be sure when you ask that question, have you any meat, the answer might be a resounding yes lord we do we have something to show for our labors something that you would be pleased with so help us tonight to understand what that means to understand how to obtain it in jesus name we pray amen all right you can be seated thank you for your attention tonight we all know that the lord jesus gave a great commission and the great commission was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature when he called those disciples that we're studying somewhat about tonight uh, he said to them, follow me and I'll make you to be fishers of what? Fishers of what? Men. Fishers of men. And uh, when he went back to the Father's right hand, he had left them with that same commission, that same responsibility. And uh, here they are, fishing, not for men, but for fish. Amen? And uh, I like the, uh, the responsibility the Lord gives us. Isn't it a good thing to be able to do the work of the Lord, to preach the gospel? And it's so much different than the fisherman's life. The fisherman catches live fish and makes them dead, but Christ has called us to go out and catch dead fish and, and make them jump up alive when they've been saved by the gospel. That's an exciting work, brother, I'll tell you. And there's nothing more 
uh, I think, revitalizing than winning a soul to Jesus. It'll refresh your own salvation experience. It'll, it'll make you feel young in the Lord again, make you ex excited to be a Christian all over. And nothing better than bringing a lost person to church and having them sit next to you. And I'll tell you what, you really want to hear the gospel that Sunday morning, and it's all just uh, exciting again to you to hear how a person can be born again. You, you just pray, Lord, make the preacher make it plain this morning. And any other time, listen, if you've been saved for any length of time, and you sit in the service, you've heard the gospel many times, the priest said, it's ho-hum. Oh, well, I've heard it. It's nothing new to me. And, and you become very bored with the gospel that saved you, and you were so excited about one time. Well, the Lord said to these disciples out in the boat, he said, have you any meat? Now, he wasn't talking about material meat like we would think of, like bologna, like uh, salami, amen, like steak. Oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? He's not talking about that kind of meat. He was talking about uh, a different kind of meat altogether. You remember in John chapter 4, where the Lord Jesus sat on the well in Samaria, there was a woman that came, and she was drawing water, and uh, he talked with her a while, and uh, she was shown that he was the Messiah. You know the first person that Christ ever revealed himself thoroughly and completely to, as to being the Messiah, was a woman, a Samaritan, and, a, and not only that, but an infamous woman at that. A woman that had five husbands and was living with a man she wasn't married to. And Christ revealed himself to her as the Messiah. What a marvelous thing that is. But there's an interesting thing that follows that encounter where she received him as the living water. And that is the disciples came back to him. They'd gone into the town to get something to eat. And they came back with some food. And they said, uh, Master, we've brought you something to eat. He says, never mind. He says, uh, I don't need it. And they said, well, has someone fed you? And he says, no. He said this, though. He says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. What he was talking about was the spiritual meat uh, that comes when we have done the Father's will and when we have won a soul to Christ, then we have satisfaction in our soul that physical food would never, ever bring us to say He had meat to eat they knew not of. And this is the meat he's talking about when he hollered out across the water. Children, have you any meat? Well, they didn't have any of that kind, nor did they have any fish. I mean, it was a, a complete zero with a rim erase as far as they were concerned. They had nothing. Now, why was it that there were no fish in the boat? Why didn't they have any meat when Jesus asked them? Well, some people would say it was because there, there just wasn't any fish around. Well, my friend, that's not the reason, because in just a few moments, the Lord Jesus said, cast the net on the right side of the boat. And they drew so many fish in that, the, the, I mean, the net began to... They just weigh heavily, and they had trouble bringing it to land. They drug it to shore, and 153 fish in one cast of the net. Now, the problem wasn't that there weren't any fish. There's plenty of fish. The problem is with us is not because there's no people to win to Christ. That's not the problem at all. There's plenty of souls out there, amen? We're just not throwing the net out. That's our problem. We're not casting the net. Now, that wasn't the reason. Well, the other people would say, well, or some would say, well, they just didn't know what they were doing. Well, I think that's a, a bad conclusion to come to because this is what these men had done from the time they were little children. Peter and James and John were fishermen. That was their profession. They were experts at this. I mean, if there was anybody to catch fish, these guys were the guys to do it. Amen? They knew all about it. They knew where to go. They knew when to go. They knew how to do it, how to let the nets down at the right time. And, and they were skunked, I'm sorry to say. No, it wasn't because they didn't know what they were doing. Our problem in soul winning is not that we don't know what we're doing. You've been saved any length of time and been attending this church. I'll guarantee you, you know how to win souls because there have been classes that teach you how. There have been opportunities for you to go. There are books in the bookstore that will teach you step by step how to win souls. As a matter of fact, most Bible-believing soul winning Baptist churches teach their people very well how to be soul winners. But you know what I've found? This is strange. I have found that when I have had intensive training sessions in our church on how to be a soul winner, I mean, how to give you testimony, how to share the scriptures, how to lead a person from the point of contact to the point of prayer, how to go through that whole thing very thoroughly, that the next Thursday or Saturday soul winning time are attended by less people than any, any other time. I don't understand that. When people have been instructed more clearly on how to be a soul winner than any other time, then they don't go. Strange, isn't it? I don't understand that. I don't have the answer to that. All I know is the problem isn't that people don't know how to do it. And the problem isn't that there aren't souls out there that need to be won. Listen, there are people out there tonight, if you'd knock on their door, you know what they'd say to you? 
but say, I've just been on my knees asking God to show me how I can know Him personally, how I can have Christ in my life, how I can get the guilt off my shoulders. I've had that experience myself, and so has anyone else who's consistent in soul winning. They're wanting to get saved. I mean, they're like fish out there waiting to be caught. They'll jump in the boat if the boat's near enough to get into. They're just not enough people doing it. Well, another reason that I see, the primary reason why there weren't any fish in the boat, nor there was any meat of significance that Christ could find that they'd been producing, was because of who was in the boat. There's our problem. Who was in the boat? Look who's in this boat. There were together Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and we know them to be James and John. And it says two other disciples. Who's Peter? Now, if we were to ask a man on the street, not necessarily even a church member, but uh, just a, a person at random, what do you know about the man called Peter in the Bible? You know what they would say? Most people would have enough Bible, I would trust, maybe not today. We're living in a day of, of a famine of the Word of God, and people are Bible ignorant, totally ignorant. But uh, say that you did have someone with a little Bible knowledge, you know what they'd say? Oh, yeah, uh, they wouldn't say, he's the man who preached on Pentecost, had 3,000 souls saved. Oh, he's the man who walked on the water. What? No. They'd say, he's the man who denied Jesus three times. Three times. That's what he's best known for. You know what keeps me down the boat and keeps souls from getting saved? Denying the Lord. Denying the Lord in our life. Denying the Lord the time. Denying the Lord the use of our personal life. You see, the Holy Spirit cannot work without a human instrument. The Holy Spirit doesn't go out door knocking and uh, when the door is open, there's no one there. You see, if we don't go, they don't get saved. And if we deny the Lord that time, now I don't know about your soul winning time, ours is traditionally Thursday night, ladies go on Thursday morning, and then we go out again on Saturday morning. But if we take those times and we deny the Lord the use of, of this physical, uh, fleshly vessel that he needs, then souls are not going to be saved because of our denying the Lord, our time, and our, our personality, and our ability. And we can make all kinds of excuses. Amen. We can, I mean, we've got a list as long as our arm of why we can't go. Uh, and uh, everything in the world will come up. It's like Murphy's Law. If it can happen, it will happen on Thursday night, Saturday morning. But you've got to just determine in your heart, I'm not going to deny the Lord. I'm not going to deny the Lord my time and the use of my life to be a fisher of men. Because that's the most important thing to him. And someday he's going to ask me, it may be very soon, that we stand and look him in the eye and he says, well, what have you got to show for the life that I've let you live since you were saved? Will I be able to say, well, Lord, you, you saved me. I was, the, I was the one, but I've got these to show for the life that I've lived. These have been saved since I was saved through my witnessing and soul winning. These are my meat, Lord. Yes, I have something. Will he say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or will he say, Oh, thou wicked and slothful servant. You denied me the opportunity to work through you. You see, the Holy Spirit come into the world to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. You know he can't do that apart from us? He can't do that. Apart from our life evidencing a walk that's separated, that's how he convicts people of sin, and a life that's living in the, the right path and walking next to God, that's how he convicts of righteousness. People see it in us. And judgment... You see, the, the God-fearing Christian is almost a relic of the past. I'm sorry to say it, but that's the truth. The God-fearing Christian is almost a relic of the past. Everything today is, is moving a direction away from living a life that has any God-fearing involved in it whatsoever. You know, we're, we, don't, we don't fear God at all. We live with a, a loose morality today, and if that wasn't so, we wouldn't see it cropping up like we do. That's sad, isn't it? But uh, people need to see that there is a group of people that believe that there is a God that's going to someday judge not only the lost, but to judge his own children for the works that they produce. Not for their salvation. I don't hold to that at all. But we will give account of ourselves, everyone, at the judgment seat of Christ. So let's not be like Peter and deny the Lord the use of our time and our life. Then there's Nathaniel. Look at this guy. Oh, excuse me, Thomas. He's listed first. Now, if we were to ask this same person on the street, what do you know about Thomas, the man in the Bible? You know what they would say? Huh? They wouldn't say, oh, yeah, Thomas, he's the one that uh, after the resurrection, uh, he said to, to Jesus, 
And my Lord and my God, after he saw with his own eyes the resurrected Christ. No, I don't think they would say that. You know what they'd say? Oh, Thomas. Yeah, he's the doubter. Thomas is the one that was doubting all the time. Okay. Do we find an application here? I believe we do. Why is it that uh, there's no meat in the boat, so to speak, no souls being saved? It's because of doubt. Because of doubt. You know, many times when we do go out to serve the Lord and go out to fish for men, we doubt that God's going to do anything. We don't have a bit of confidence that God's going to really use us. You know, we, we're supposed to go believing. I like the scripture that the brother shared tonight from the Gideon. He shared that one that God's word would not return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it in the world. You've got to believe with all your heart that when you go out, no matter whether you see visible results or not, God's going to use you. God's going to use you to plant seed. I mean, if that wasn't true, then why would he give us a verse like Psalm 126, 5 and 6 in that, in that section of Scripture? He says, He that goeth forth with weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. Right? Will we not doubtless? What does doubtless mean? No doubt. Doubtless. Less the doubt. We will come. You know, most people quit soul winning just short of victory. They quit going just before they get to have the joy of winning a soul because they get discouraged. You say, well, preacher, don't you ever get discouraged every week? <laughs> yeah, I do. Oh, I've had some bad days. I've had some terrible days. I mean, I've had days where every door I knocked on, it seemed like, uh, I mean, the, the guy inside had been, been uh, drinking pickle juice or something. I mean, just sour attitudes and, and mean and, and turn the dogs on you, that kind of day, you know? I mean, it got to the point where I was weeping, just physically weeping, because it was such a bad day. Huh? But you know, I still go. I haven't quit. I've had people call the police on me. Amen. I've gotten to learn when I meet somebody, I know he's going to call the police. I go through the rest of that area real quick so that I can get out before they come. Amen. Amen. Well, that's, that's going to happen more and more. We just have to get used to that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, don't be a doubter. Don't doubt that God can use you. You see, if he used the men in the Bible that you read about, he can use you. Hmm? I remember the first time I ever went stolen, first time, I went with a friend of mine in Sacramento, and he had been saved just about the same time I was, and uh, we went out and we stopped to get gas on the way. He had this old Buick. And the attendant was putting gas in his tank, and, and Greg was his name. He started witnessing to this gas station attendant. He said, sir, could I ask you a question? The man said, well, certainly. He said, are you a Christian? The man said, well, yes, I am. And I thought, well, good, praise the Lord, we have another brother here, a Christian, you know. And, and then my friend proceeded to ask him, he said, I mean, how do you know that you're a Christian? I thought to myself, well, the man just said he was. What's wrong with you? And, and the man said, well, he said, I just, uh, I just know I am. He said, listen, if you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And I thought, well, he's going to get this man angry, you know. My first soul winning experience was one that, that was... Uh, a little disconcerting to me. I thought, boy, he is just pushing and pushing. What he's trying to do is really nail the man down to whether he's saved or not. I learned a long time ago that somebody says he's a Christian doesn't mean he is. May not know the first thing about being a Christian. Most people think because they live in the United States that they're a Christian. Oh, they think, well, I'm not a heathen. Huh? I think Dr. Ruffman has said he was asked the question one time. Where did the heathen go? You know, people ask you that. What about the people that live in all these other lands, the heathen? He said, he was asked the question, where do the heathen go? And he answered like, oh, they go to Kmart, they go to Sears, they go to Penny's. You know, I thought that was a tremendous answer. I've used that again and again. Uh, that's true. Anybody without Christ is a heathen. A uh, barbarian, that's another Bible word. It's a good word. Well, there's Peter, the doubter, the denier, and there's Thomas, the doubter, and then there's Nathaniel, the skeptic. The skeptic. That's what the man on the street would say about Nathaniel. Oh, yeah, Nathaniel, he was, he was the guy who said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? The skeptical kind of person when he was told, hey, we found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Ah, he said, you got to be kidding me. Can't be any good thing come out of Nazareth. Hmm? Have you ever been around people like that? They're the pessimistic kind of person. Huh? No matter what it is, they see the negative side of it. Oh, I don't like to be around people like that. I guess we have to have all kinds in the world. But uh, I had a man in my church that for years, every time we'd have a meeting, he would be the only person to vote against something. The only one. And I'd stop him after the meeting. I'd say, Brother, I said, why are you against that? He said, I just don't think anything ought to be unanimous. 
I think it's a dangerous thing when things are just unanimous. I said, boy, you put a damper on everything when you do that. That was his attitude. You know, he's changed a lot. He came back and told me here this summer, he said, Pastor, I'm sorry for all the problems I caused you. He moved away, and they were stationed in another place, and they couldn't find a good church, and they, you know what, they appreciated the one they'd left. And man, sometimes we have to lose something before we appreciate what we've got. That's a sad thing, but it's true. Well, Nathaniel's a skeptical kind of a person. You know what the word skeptic means? It means a member of an ancient philosophic school which denied the possibility of real knowledge of any kind. They approach everything with a negative attitude. Just, I mean, they see the bad side of everything. You know, somebody they might talk to about Christ, might pray, and ask the Lord to save them, and then they'd look at him and say, well, I really don't think you were sincere. Huh? Yeah. Or they'd watch somebody walk the aisle and they'd say, oh, yeah, well, let's see what's going to happen to them. Yeah, they won't last. I don't believe it's real. They have absolute, no, absolute, no confidence in what people do. Huh? The skeptical kind of person. It's really hard to motivate that kind of person to do anything. I read an illustration of a preacher one time whose church was just, I mean, it was just barely moving ahead. And he said, you know, folks, he said, it's, it's, it's too long this church has been crawling along. It's time that, that, that we started to stand up. And a couple of people said amen to that. And he got encouraged. He said, you know, and after we've stood a while, he said, then it's time this church begins to walk. And somebody out there hollered back, well, then let her walk, preacher, let her walk. Well, the preacher got even more excited, and he reared back, and he said, and after we walk a while, he said, we're going to begin to run. And they said, let her run, preacher. People are getting enthused. And he even got more inspired by that, and he said, after we run a while, he said, we're going to let her fly. And they all said, let her fly, preacher. Let her fly. And he said, if we're going to walk and run and fly, he said, it's going to take money. And they all said, let her crawl, preacher. Let her crawl. You know, everybody's excited about going ahead, but nobody wants to get involved in what it takes to go ahead. You see, everybody likes to see churches just having revival fires springing up all over, but nobody wants to get on their knees and pray it down or go out and witness in God's power to see it happen. You see, that's where revival comes from. It comes from people who are willing to pay the price. It costs. It costs. Nothing in God's work comes easy. Amen? We can't do anything without God, but God cannot do his part unless we do our part and the skeptic is the kind of person that's just so negative i presented to our church years and years ago when we were still meeting in the rented building meeting in homes on wednesday night i said you know folks it's about time that we started seriously looking for some property or some place to be permanently located and one of the men had the audacity to say this he said pastor we don't need to look for property he said we could meet in the back seat of your car i said bless your heart <laughs> Boy, you talk about pouring cold water on people's enthusiasm. People like that. We just don't really need that, do we? I mean, if you have that, that feeling, just kind of keep it inside. Don't express it. Amen. And then there's James and John. James and John. Well, they're not as familiar as the other three are, but uh, I think that if you know anything about their uh, life and the way they live in the New Testament, they were certainly changed by Christ, but... They were called Boanerges. It means the sons of thunder. Boy, they were hot-blooded guys. I mean, they were just, I mean, raring to go all the time. When uh, a town rejected Christ, they said, well, can we call down fire from heaven and burn them up? And the Lord said, no. He said, you don't know what spirit you're of. He said, I didn't come to destroy. I've come to save. Man, you destroy them before I can save them. You know, and they're zealous guys. They really go-getters. Remember one time that their mother came to Jesus? And, uh, he said, uh, she said to him, Lord, she said, now, she's just like a typical mom wanting to see her son do well. I mean, get ahead in the world, right? She said, now, 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 Lord, my sons, they've left the business, you know. Mr. Zebedee and I, you know, the fishing company, they've left and they're following you now. And in your kingdom, could my son sit on your right hand and on your left? And she wanted to secure a position for her boy. Now, there's a lot more than meets the eye to that because they didn't have social security in those days. They didn't have welfare. And the cute thing about herself, when she gets up in years, she's going to need sons that can take care of her. That's God's way to do it. You're supposed to take care of your parents. Amen? Not put them in a rest home somewhere and just skip them off. It's the children's responsibility to care for their parents, honor their parents in their aged years, their declining time. And not much of that goes on nowadays. We need to really get back to the Bible way of doing things. And so 
Here's Mama looking out for James and John. What could we say about that? We could say that's a little bit of position seeking. Wouldn't you call it that? Well, Jesus got her kind of squared away on that. He said, when they can be baptized with my baptism, then they can earn that position. And he said, they will be. You see, they will be. And they were. Both of those men were tried severely before they were allowed to go on home to glory. They were tried by fire. Yes, indeed, they were. But uh, position seeking keeps meat out of the boat. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about this whole attitude of asserting ourselves and uh, promoting ourselves and getting bitter because uh, we're not given the position we think we should have or perhaps we're not appreciated like we think we should be. You know, you know there's an illustration that Jesus gave in, in the Gospel of a servant. And I think he was trying to settle a matter the disciples were disputing about as to who would be the greatest and all of this. And he said, let me tell you something. He said, a servant goes to work in the field. He works all day, comes in tired and hungry and weary. And he says, does the servant's master tell him to sit down and rest and, and uh, I'll get you something to eat and a cool glass of water? He said, I throw not. He said, no, I, that's not so. He says, instead, the master expects the servant after that long day to come in and then fix the meal for him, prepare it all, serve him, and then after it's all done, then the master will say, now you go ahead and get yourself something to eat. And then he said this. He says, after all of that, does the master thank the servant? He said, no, because the servant has only done that which was his duty to do. What a lesson that is. Boy, I mean, that just hits us right between the eyes, doesn't it? Many times we serve for what we get out of it instead of what we can put into it. And we won't serve very long if we're serving on the basis of how much we're appreciated or recognized. We'll give up. We'll quit. We'll say, well, well, after all I've done around here, and no one ever takes notice of it, no one ever says anything about it, I'm going to quit. But who are we doing it for? Preachers are prone to this as anybody. Who do we do it for? Are we doing it for others to recognize us and for ourselves to be, you know, in a sense, lifted up? Or are we doing it as unto the Lord? If we're serving as unto the Lord, you know what? We know he appreciates it. We know he takes account of it. He said even a cup of cold water given in my name will not go unrewarded. He's keeping the record. If we go out like the Pharisees, stand on the street corners and, and blow a horn, to do, to do, I'm going to give an alms to this poor beggar man here and put our money in and hope everybody sees how good we are and says, oh my, what a good giving person. And that's the only reason we're doing it. He says, you've got your reward. That's all you're going to get. I just didn't have them stacking up in heaven. Amen. And do things no one knows about. In our church, a lot of times there's a a need someone has and people put money in their car, load their car up with food while they're in the service at night. They come out, they can't even get in their car. It's too many groceries, you know. No one knows who did it and no one wants anybody to know who did it. And that's where it ought to be. Let not your right hand know what your left hand does. Now, if you'll serve on that basis, you won't burn out. You won't quit. You'll keep on serving God the rest of your life because you're serving God. See, James and John, maybe a little self-seeking. That'll keep me out of the boat because we quit going. Well, I've been out on soul winning for three solid weeks. You know, the preacher never mentioned that to the congregation. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with appreciating folks. Amen. We can appreciate one another. Nothing wrong with servants appreciating one another and recognizing one another. That's good. But we shouldn't need that. We shouldn't need that to be faithful and keep going. Well, we've seen several things keep meat out of the boat tonight. Denying the Lord all the time in our life to be used by Him. We've seen that doubting, the fact that we doubt God's using of our lives will cause us not to go. And we've seen also that there's the skeptical attitude, the negative kind of thing of, well, why go? Nothing's going to happen. I bring people to church, and then Pastor Blue gets up and preaches, and they say they'll never come back again, so why bring people to church? Uh, Well, if they got offended because of the Word of God and the cross of Christ, that's what they needed first. They needed that first. That's necessary. You don't get unguilty people saved. They've got to get the bad news and accept it before they can accept the good news. That's just the way it is. Don't, don't become a skeptic about it and say, well, it'll never work for me. You keep at it. Be faithful. You shall reap in due season if you think not. And then position seeking. Wanting recognition or wanting appreciation. 
Those are the things that keep meat out of the boat. That's why they toiled all night, perhaps, and caught nothing. But then it says, lastly, that there were two other of his disciples. You know, try as you will, you'll never figure out who they were. Oh, you could be guessing all night long, say, well, I think it was this one, I think it was that one, I think it was this. It doesn't tell you anywhere in the Bible who they were. And I thought for a while, after I was working on this message several years ago, why doesn't the Lord tell us who they are? I think there's a reason for that. You know who those other two are? You and me. That's you and me. Now, we can either be keeping meat out of the boat or bringing it into the boat. Amen? There are other reasons why souls are not getting saved. And it may be because of us. Maybe something in our life. Maybe because of sin in our life. You see, God looks at a church as a body. My wife has cancer on her ankle. And the doctor did not say to her, you have cancer on your ankle or your ankle has cancer. No, he says, there's cancer in your body. You see, the whole body is affected by what's happening on the ankle. And this whole church body is affected by what's happening with each member. You know, when Achan sinned, Israel lost the battle against Ai, didn't they? And we could very possibly be the reason why fish are not being brought in and souls are not being saved. We need to inspect ourselves, amen, examine our own hearts and our own minds. That could be the reason. Perhaps we're not friendly. Are you friendly? Yeah. I think uh, Wednesday night crowds are the friendliest crowds of all. I, you know, amen. The people who come on Sunday morning, they come for other people to see them. The people who come on Sunday night come because of the preacher, and the people who come on Wednesday night come because they love the Lord. Amen. Is that true? Friendliness is a key to reaching other people. And a warmth and a love for people will win souls. And he that would have friends must do what? Show himself to be friendly. Let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you that uh, we've had the chance to share these thoughts and, and Lord to consider the question that Christ asked the disciples. Children, have you any need? And I would ask tonight as we think these things through our own hearts and our own minds that Lord you'd point out to each person here, myself included, that if souls are not being saved, if we're not being successful, then perhaps the, some of these reasons are the cause. And I would ask that tonight, Lord, that if there be that area of a person's life that's lacking or perhaps something they're doing that they ought not to do, that, Lord, you bring that to their mind and that that might be forsaken, it might be confessed to you, and that, Lord, a change might take place in that life and that in just a very short time there might be a time of rejoicing and joy in the camp because the sinners come home. Souls have been saved. Lives have been touched and changed. And Lord, if that's done and that is being accomplished, there will be a revival to break out in the midst of any church that has a soul-conscious congregation. Lord, that has a, a congregation that's hungry not just for the physical potluck dinners and fellowship times, but hungry for the meat that Jesus taught us of, the meat of soul winning. And I ask that tonight we might be soul winners First and foremost, for you. In Jesus' name we pray.